It's an opening day tradition on the Fenway Rundown. I think this is year three, maybe, that we've done this. We have Sam Kennedy, the Red Sox president and CEO, joining myself, Chris Cotillo, and Sean McAdam on the show today. Sam, it is that time of year. You know it's time for the season to start once you uh, talk to us. Um, We appreciate, as always, you joining the show. Great to be with you guys. Thanks for uh, having me on. Thanks for uh, doing this each year and happy uh, opening day Eve. It's going to be uh, a late, late couple of weeks for us all. And Sean is in Seattle, as we mentioned. I am still uh, in Boston. Chris Smith will be joining him out there. Sam, I know you know what the narrative is around this team. Expectations may be lower than at any point since you've been with the organization, at least publicly. Um, from the inside, from the top of the organization, what are your expectations and how do you define a successful 2024 Red Sox season? Yeah, it's a great question, Chris. Definitely no no hiding from the narrative, from uh, the fact that it, it feels like um, there's there's not a um, big level of, of expectation on the outside. Um, I will tell you, uh, and it's probably because his confidence and enthusiasm is so contagious from the inside. Um, uh, Alex Cora, uh, Craig Breslow, the players uh, feel um, like they've got something to prove. There's a, a lot of optimism around the additions and the, the, the focus on athleticism and speed and defense and, um, and, and building around this core of young guys. So uh, I feel like this team, um, we feel like we have something to prove, uh, and uh, that's a good spot to be in. There's, there's always optimism this time of year, uh, but there's a there's a really a heightened sense of it. I spent more time than I ever have before around the team this year uh, in spring training. I was uh, I was down there most of the spring. Um, first time I've been able to do that. The kids are off in college. And so uh, I worked out of uh, Fort Myers for uh, a lot of the spring. And there is a, a palpable energy and an excitement. Um, so look, we we got to stay healthy. That's the main thing. Everyone says it. It's a cliche, but it's true. If we can stay healthy, we're going to be right in this thing. And, and we expect a competitive 2024 Boston Red Sox. And for the fans out there that have already kind of written this team off, you know, for right or for wrong, like why should they be excited in your mind? Well, I think we need to earn uh, our fans' uh, trust and and support uh, this year. We, we we need to do that each and every year. Um, but you can really feel um, this this team, this core uh, emerging. You know, we, we we did the extension with Bayo at the top of the rotation, and um, we've got reliable Nick Pavetta and and, and Cutter Crawford followed by Howick and Whitlock. And and I think if these guys who are working closely with Andrew Bailey and Justin Willard and Brez himself and and obviously AC, everyone buying into the change in our pitching approach, um, that's probably the most important change. And and, um, those are just words. uh, So you have to see it play out. But that's that's to me, um, the most exciting thing here is uh, the change in the approach um, that we're going to bring for our 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 starting rotation, um, the young uh, talent that we have in that rotation. And um, that's something that, you know, has has been missing. Um, I think you look at the offense, uh, you look at our positional players, I, I I think even the skeptics would agree that um, it's a pretty potent lineup and 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 a group that uh, should score some runs. So got to go out and do it. But um, those are some things to be excited about and focused on. Sam, from where you sit as team president and CEO on the business side of things, give us a sense of what it looks like from that seat. Ticket sales, partnerships, sponsorships, sweet renewals. What is the appetite in both the fan and business community for the 2024 Red Sox? Yeah, well, it's a great question, Sean. Uh, when you, anytime you have two losing or down seasons, you you do get a lag, a negative lag effect the following year. We have been humbled by the support that we've had uh, from our fans, from our corporate sponsors, from our broadcast partners. Um, our our ticket sales are 
lagging uh, down a little bit from last year. We're down about uh, 5%, um, but in no way has there been a major uh, drop off at this point. Um, look, we've got to perform and get people excited as we get, especially in the early months when the weather's not going to be good. Um, so we're down about 5% in, in our, our ticket sales. Um, and we can, we've got time to make that up. Sponsors, uh, our sponsorship revenue is up. That is a um, 1 million percent credit to the incredible uh, group of 100 plus local, regional and national companies who support the Red Sox. Uh, we're very grateful for that. It's a credit to them for believing in us, for understanding that the marketing with the Red Sox is a, is a great way to build your brand. It's also a credit to True Parkinson, to Marcel Bangu, um, to the group that leads our corporate partnership effort, all the people at Fenway Sports Management who take care of these clients. Uh, so we're, we're, we're hanging in there, but we recognize we, we, we've got to turn things around and we've got to play better baseball uh, to, to honor the commitment that both of our fans and our sponsors have made to us. You talked about being in Fort Myers for an extended period. You live fairly close to the ballpark um, in Brookline. I know that you're out in the neighborhood. Anecdotally, what are fans who come up and talk to you either at JetBlue or around Fort Myers or around Fenway in Kenmore Square? What are you hearing from them about what the team has done or maybe hasn't done and what they're feeling as the season is getting started. Yeah. Um, it's it, the thing about living in the neighbor. I actually moved. We're, we're actually in Boston now and it, it, living right near the ballpark. You're not escaping anything. Um, so I'm a Dunkin Donuts guy. guy. I think everybody knows that. Uh, anyone who knows me knows that uh, unfortunately sometimes multiple trips a day and you hear it all. You know, it's it's really interesting because social media narrative, of course, is very negative. Um, and I just think that's social media <laughs> in general. But the 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 real narrative, um, uh, by the way, uh, unrelated, I was at an event with Al Michaels, uh, who was moderating a panel uh, earlier in the winter, and he had a great line about social media. So I don't know why it's called social media. It's anti-social media. Isn't it the most anti-social thing ever created? And he's so right about that. But of course, so of course, the social media narrative uh, is negative. A lot of negativity comes out there. Uh, but when you're in Dunkin' Donuts in the morning or you're walking to the ballpark or you're at Fort Myers, you hear a wide range of things. You hear a lot of people say, hey, come on, why aren't we doing this or sign this guy or do that or make a trade? Um, but you also hear um Fans who say, you know, we're really excited about a lot of these young players. We're excited about what we've been seeing in spring training. There's a lot to be optimistic about. And those are real fans. Um, those are fans who support us through thick and thin. Last night, I was at an event uh, at the Kennedy Library, um, and a season ticket holder came up to me and he said, listen, I renewed for my 41st year. He said, you guys, I I've been through the thick and thin he said, I really am optimistic about this team, um, and I know a lot of people aren't, uh, but I just want you to know I'm supporting you. So people are far nicer in person. I don't think you're going to be surprised to hear that. Uh, but the great thing about Red Sox fans is there are people who let you have it in person as well. Uh, and that's what makes Boston so great. So it's it's all over the map. Uh, the truth is uh, nobody really knows what's going to happen, of course. Uh, but there, there's um, there's a, a wide range of uh, opinions in Red Sox Nation right now, which is uh, which is totally fair and understandable. I think the perception everywhere is that fan interest is down. Do you think that's the case? I mean, across the board and just how do you quantify that? Is it just ticket sales? Is it Nesson ratings? And and how do you look at where it is right now? Yeah, listen, anytime, again, you 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 have uh, a difficult season, not to mention back to back difficult seasons, even though when, you know, in, in um, especially in 2022, you know, felt like felt like we were really really going to build on 21 and and take that next step with the signing of of Trevor um anytime you have down years you you're going to have um unrest uneasiness anger uh we 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 get that uh, i don't think 
Uh, and again, it's probably just the way I'm wired, having grown up here as a as a diehard Red Sox fan and and family members who are diehard Red Sox fans. I, I think the fandom is is there, the interest is there, but what our fans want, what they're screaming out for, is competitive. Uh, quality baseball night in and night out and a chance to compete in the American League East. And that's what that's what we need to give them. That's what we 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 need to give them year in and year out. And that's what we hope to give them in 2024. I think that's a, a good segue to what fans would describe across the board as a disappointing offseason. Uh, the messaging was full throttle at the beginning. Obviously, you know, that was walked back around winter weekend. And you see with, you know, the moves that have been made, um, Lucas Giolito, unfortunately, out for the season, but that was kind of the only big time addition on the free agent market. And you largely stayed out of of the big name additions. At what point, and obviously the question really, I think, revolves around the budget and and when that was set. But at what point did you, as an organization, come to the conclusion that this all in approach, this adding stars, that full throttle wasn't what you were going to do this winter? Yeah. Um without um, speaking specifically about the budget or tipping our hand in terms of how um, we want to operate vis-a-vis our competitors in the American League East, um, I'll tell you that we had a very active and busy offseason in many ways, starting with a general manager search that began in right. mid, mid-September um, and, and really looking, taking a, a look at the whole baseball operation. Um, so that's been, that was a huge uh, focus of ours. Um, we were engaged on many free agents. We, we obviously matched up on um, with Giolito. We did not match up with, with others. Uh, and so look, we're, we're focused on, on who we have and getting the most out of who we have and you know, I said it at, at winter weekend, and you know, I'll say it again, we do have budget parameters. I'm going to be direct and honest and open with you. We don't talk about them publicly. We always have. Um, we've also had an ownership group that establishes budget parameters uh, and then has shown a willingness to expand beyond those parameters. And there's no difference uh, now in that operating philosophy uh, for the right opportunity, for the right deal. But we have a budget that we that we that guides our operation. Uh, all teams, uh, I believe, do. Um, but we also have uh, an invested ownership that has been willing to extend in certain cases, um, has been willing to extend at the trade deadline. Um, and so that that's not going to change uh, given the competitive makeup. But we are building something. We are building ar- around players like Brian Bayo and, and, and Garrett Whitlock. And, um, you know, we're excited about uh, Sedan Rafaela and some of these younger guys that are coming up and we made the big sort of splash last year with a $331 million deal for Rafi Devers. Um, it's easy to sort of just whistle past that one. I, I get that when it's uh, convenient for a, a more negative narrative around spending, but um, that's a, a massive, massive commitment that this organization made and 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 excited about a homegrown player um, playing the rest of his career with the Boston Red Sox. So um, we're going to continue to uh, do everything we can to to be competitive and um, and 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 have flexibility with respect to our operations. But we do operate um, within a, a, a budget uh, that. Um, is subject to change uh, in in real time, uh, uh, subject to opportunities that might uh, push us uh, in one direction or the other. In, in simple terms, I guess, and, and understanding, you know, the Rafi deal is the biggest in franchise history, and um, he's a guy that obviously you want to build around. But why why did the budget go down from twenty twenty two or from twenty twenty three to twenty twenty four? Look, I, I'm I'm not going to talk about specific budget mm-hmm. figures, you know, not, but um, also not going to mislead anybody. Right now, our our budget is um, uh, lower than it than it was. It's I think it's a reflection of where we are at this exact moment um, in terms of the build and in terms of the, our overall business. Um, but that doesn't mean we don't have the opportunity down the road in future years maybe even this year to add to where we are. We'll see um, how things go. So one of the nice things about, um, you know, working for very experienced owners 
who you know collectively have uh, a century of uh, experience in owning and operating a baseball team and John Henry and, and Tom Werner and Mike Gordon and all the partners, um, they, they understand that this business, you have to be able to read and react, you, you change, uh, you adjust. Um, and so, look, let's let's see how uh, things start this year and 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 we'll see where our current level of investment takes us. Um, and 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 if we're starting to play competitively, uh, I think, you know, that that'll be a really great thing as we as we as start to go forward this year. Um, and, and we recognize it's been I want to be direct and candid to our fans. We recognize it's been a, a very difficult uh, two seasons. We do not um, see ourselves uh, as a, a team that is content with finishing in, in last place. We are uh, about playing baseball in October and ultimately winning World Series championships, and, and we got to get back to that. Sam, you talked about the job search that led you to hire – Craig Breslow at the end of October and introduce him in the uh, beginning of November. As we noted from a free agent standpoint, it was a very quiet, just two major league free agent signings until Chase Anderson got added over the weekend, a couple of trades. So not a whole lot of personnel churn there, but what would you, how would you describe Craig Breslow's impact uh, in his say first five months on the job here? What's different about the organization now that Craig Breslow is overseeing baseball ops? Well, it's um, it's been extraordinary uh, in terms of his um, uh, his impact early with respect to uh, revamping our pitching infrastructure um, and his experience as a player. I, I just don't think you can put a price tag on um, – someone who has worn a Boston Red Sox uniform, someone who has uh, got multiple World Series rings, recognizing, I think he feels a little bit guilty about the ring he has for the 07 season, uh, just because he was with us for a day, but he's got he's got two of them. He knows what it means to win here, obviously a valuable contributor in 2013, lived in the area, he's a New Englander, his family is around, and 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 so it's great to have that player perspective. It's also um, great to have someone who is 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 really really competitive and wants to um, you know he he's spending twenty four seven literally he's working late into the night every single night he is all in for this organization um, and it's been it's been great to have him and and it's very early days but he's been um, great in terms of communication in terms of working with Alex and the staff. Uh, dealing with the media, dealing with ownership. He's he's really done a, a terrific job so far and excited to see uh, his career progress as, as a top baseball operations official. The other baseball official uh, of note is, of course, Alex Cora, who goes into 2024 on the final year of his deal. Um, it's been a while since you have begun a season with a manager on the final year of his deal. Often you presented those managers with extensions beforehand, so there wasn't that awkwardness. Is it awkward to start the year with a manager who is not signed past October? And where do uh, you view Alex Cora right now in terms of his uh, future with the Red Sox? Well, first of all, it would be awkward uh, let's, let's be honest, um, uh, if you didn't have, um, the type of, uh, leader in Craig Breslow that we have, or the type of person that we have in Alex Cora, um, both parties recognize they have an obligation and responsibility to the Boston Red Sox, um, to do everything in their power to help us win. Therefore, um, given we made the change uh, at the general manager position, uh, we we put Brez and Alex in a position that you could say would be awkward. The way that we dealt with that was to ensure open, honest, transparent communication, um, which Craig Breslow has taken the lead on and Alex Cora has reciprocated. And those two had a pre-existing relationship. They're building. This is the most important. It's the most precious 
relationship in baseball, in my opinion, the, the relationship between your general manager and the manager um, it's, it's critical for overall team success. Anytime um, we've had success here in my 23 years, uh, we've had a, a, a fantastic working relationship, not always agreeing uh, with each other, but, but being open and honest and direct whether it was Theo and Tito or Ben and, and John or, or Dave and, and, um, and Alex, it, it really has been a joy to watch and to support from where I sit in a position of leadership. Um, so they have been building that relationship, building that trust, building that communication. In terms of Alex Cora, I, I've never seen him and I've, I've known him a long, long time. Um, I've never seen him as energetic, optimistic, confident, um, excited about a season as he is for the 2024 season. I think he, you know, he admitted, he said he was in a, a down sort of spot last year. I'm not really sure the rest of us saw that all too often because he is so engaging and, and optimistic. Um, but he, as you know, it's widely um, reported on and talked about. He decided to go out with and and Helica and uh, as her, she trains for the marathon coming up and, and started running with her. And he's in like literally his playing shape. Um, he weighs what he weigh, weighed as a player, which is uh, remarkable. He feels good. He's got a ton of energy. He is totally comfortable with where things stand. He's been very open about that. Um, and and we really appreciate how he's handled it. More importantly, we appreciate how Craig Breslow's handled it. He's in charge. Brez is in charge of our baseball operation. He needs to make this decision when it's right uh, for the organization. Um, and we'll have those discussions uh, as we go forward from here. But there's just been great communication, very open, very honest. And uh, I anticipate that continuing. Obviously, you get into the emotion of the season and things can change. Uh, so I think we all have to be mindful of that. Um, and we've had those discussions, too, that once you get into the season, wins and losses, um, things change, things get emotional. And so we've uh, we, we, we've discussed that and, and we'll be monitoring all of our approaches uh, as we continue those discussions. You have said, and the and ownership has said that Alex's future, and you just sort of reiterated it, will be determined by Craig Breslow. Uh, is there a chance that there could be a contract extension worked on early in this season to sort of get that off the table and not have it hanging over the team at all? You know, I'll keep that um, internal. Appreciate the question, but really i don't want to um comment on that in any way shape or form just because that's really important that those discussions are uh between craig uh, and ac at the appropriate time sam i've asked you this in previous years and you kind of touched on it a little earlier but kind of the the pushing back against the narratives that are out there i've asked you the i think verbatim before but in the mind of the president of the red sox what are the most inaccurate narratives about the team right now and why are they wrong? Well, uh, first of all, I've not been very good at at uh, publicly pushing back against that narrative. Um, I think I've let my frustration um, with that narrative get get out there publicly and I, I, I need to be better than that. I need to be stronger than that. Um, it I think it's rooted in my love for this team and my love for this city. Um, and so the narrative that ownership doesn't care or ownership is not committed, that's definitely the narrative that um, that bothers me the most uh, mm -hmm. it, as a, the leader of the organization, just because I see how invested John Henry, Linda Henry, Tom Werner, Mike Gordon, Seth Klarman, Mike Egan, you know, all of Frank Resnick, all of our LeBron, you get a mental LeBron, LeBron too. Yeah. All, all of our investors are in the success of the Red Sox. Our, our company, Fenway Sports Group, started uh with a with a vision and a mission 
which was to bring World Series championships to Boston. Um, and and second was to examine what to do with Fenway Park. Remember, when we all came in in 2002, we weren't sure if Fenway was going to survive. And we, we decided to preserve and protect Fenway. Um, and then the third thing was we made a commitment to be active in this community um, and give back. And um, others will judge how we've done on sort of those three goals that we laid out 23 years ago. Um, and yes, we have expanded into other businesses. Fenway Sports Group has grown in, in incredible ways, but the commitment and the love and the passion uh, for the Boston Red Sox from our ownership, from the very top, from John Henry on down, um, has never wavered once. Um, the only thing that's changed is we've 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 had we've had failures. Um, actually, that's not changed. We, we've had failures in the past too. But when you're in the moment, when you're not competitive, uh, it is very easy to criticize for that, and we have to we have to accept that. And um, maybe I should just talk less uh, about it, and let's just go out and and be competitive um, on the field, and 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 then everything will take care of itself. I think, and this is uh, this is not like an ambush criticism on a podcast. It's a what people would fans say. Like, do you guys ever think that having John talk about the team might make people think that he cares more than that perception is? Look, it's um, it, when when you are the principal owner uh, of a baseball team, um, you know, going out and and talking to the media. I, I understand the the desire of. Um, the media to have those conversations. And John has been available in the past to talk to the media. Um, he's also been available to the media in different formats other than media scrums or, or mm -hmm. press conferences. He's, uh, But I think his, what, what people, what, what Red Sox fans um, should judge us on is with those, those sort of goals that I laid out from the very beginning, because I was thinking about it, you know, a lot as we're approaching the season, um, that has always been the goal, winning championships, giving the best possible customer experience at, at the best ballpark, literally in, in, in the world, uh, in Fenway Park, and being active in the community and objectively gauge um, how John Henry and Tom Werner have done uh, in those three areas. Uh, and, and that's what they'll, they'll ultimately, that will be the standard that they're judged by um, and not whether they're making themselves available, you know, to the media for a scrum. And, and yes, I, I get that people um, sometimes want to hear more from us. Sometimes they want to hear less from us. Um, I, I totally get that. That's fair criticism. We'll take it. But I can tell you as someone who has worked for those two guys for 23 years, the passion, the fire, the hunger, the commitment, the drive to winning baseball and being competitive and winning more championships is there. Um, and again, those are words. You've got to do it. Um, but I but thank God everybody's healthy um, and the commitment is there. We just have to go do it so, so that that narrative changes. Sam, you referenced Fenway Sports Group, which is a increasingly uh, bigger international sports conglomerate with tentacles all over the world, from Liverpool to Pittsburgh to new sports to PGA investments. And you were recently made president and CEO of Fenway Sports Group um, over the winter. I'm wondering at some point, um, do the time and responsibilities of being president and CEO of the Red Sox um, become too much given all the other things you are doing for FSG and whether in your mind you have any thought about leaving this position to take a more, to concentrate more fully on the overarching job at FSG? Yeah. Not that I'm trying to push you out. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's a totally fair question, um, and 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 I understand why you asked. The, the answer is an emphatic no. Um, I uh, I am blessed to be the president and CEO of the Boston Red Sox. 
Uh, I've been in this position since 2000 and the end, middle of 2015, been with the organization going back to 2002. Um, I was honored to be given the title uh, of CEO of Fenway Sports Group at our last board meeting. I think it was a reflection of the incredible people in this organization uh, across Fenway. Um, what, what it really means is that I am uh, available to John and Tom and Mike and 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 the ownership group um, to help uh, executives across uh, the, the the portfolio um, with management related issues. In terms of the Red Sox, um, you know you can you can see over my my shoulder where I am here at Fenway. Uh, this is uh, very much um, my priority and and commitment, and that will continue. That said, that uh, recognition was only made possible because of incredible executives within the Red Sox, people like our chief operating officer, Jonathan Galula, uh, Becca Saulwasser, our EVP of community and social impact, True Parkinson with sponsors, Ron Bumgarner with ticketing, Adam Grossman, Amy Warius, who leads our people effort. There's so, I could go on and on about the senior leadership team that we have. Um, obviously, with I've spent a lot more time with baseball operations the last couple of months, given the transition to, to Craig Breslow, but now that we have him uh, on board, the organization um, in terms of our executive leadership is in really great shape. But I see that as my role. My role is to make sure we have the best possible people in each of the critical positions uh, and then support them with communication with ownership and providing them the resources to do their job. Um, and that, that won't change uh, in, in terms of uh, my future and 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 again, I I I hope that those types of um, it's and it's a fair question. It's a natural question. If we're doing the right things on the field, um, you know, pe people don't really care and shouldn't really care that much about CEOs or executives. They should care about the players and and winning uh, baseball. And and it's our job to to give that to the to the fans and 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 to the media, frankly. Back to the players, back to the baseball side directly. Obviously, you guys got the deal done with Bayo. You've said time and time again you'd like a lot of those deals to happen. Do you anticipate anything else imminent on that front, on the extension front at this point? Well, I'm I'm, I'm hopeful. Um, I'm hopeful. I know it's uh, – what time is it in Seattle, Sean? Uh, <laughs> uh, it's 5.36. It's early out you, there. You, you have about 24 hours before <laughs> first pitch. Look, we, uh, what I'll say on that is um, Brez and, and his team uh, are engaged, have been engaged in a lot of um, discussions, internal discussions, external discussions, um, free agent conversations, uh, internally, the, the, the formula of signing and extending um, your known entities, your known talent uh, is is really important. And there's lots of uh, those discussions that have gone on um, is all I can say publicly. But I think it, I'm hopeful that we'll we'll be in a position um, to to get something across the line here soon. We may not, but um, it'd be great to get multiple deals across the line. There's uh, a lot of conversations going on. The, the, the most rewarding thing is to hear from players that have grown up in the organization um, or players that have been here for many years. Uh, this is where they want to be and this is where they want to play. That's one of the biggest uh, things that I've learned in 23 years, trying to put a value on um, players that want to play in Boston, that want to work in Boston is really uh, I think that's underrated and undervalued because this market is not for everybody. Um, it's obviously for us, for the for the three of us on this Zoom, but it's not for everybody. And we know that. So once you know that you have someone who's capable of success in Boston, I think it's important that you ferociously uh, go after them to try and try and keep them here. So ju just to clarify, Sam, there are there are multiple conversations going on with players about extensions as we speak the day before the season? <laughs> um, 
I don't want to give you anything that is factually incorrect. There have been multiple conversations going on um, up up until this point. Um, I don't know exactly where Brez stands with uh, each and every one of those, but I am hopeful uh, that uh, they'll that that something may get over the line uh, either pr prior to opening day or or shortly thereafter. Um, but you know, I, I'm an optimist. I'm I'm hopeful, um, but certainly can't guarantee anything. So we'll see. We'll see what the next 24 hours brings. You'll have to jump back on and re-record with us to announce them because that's <laughs> how, uh, you know. And of course, as we say every year, when you finally land that all-star game bid, that'll be an emergency Fenway rundown episode as well. <laughs> we need to uh, we need to get going on our real estate development plan. So the um, when we finally do bring the All Star Game back after a thirty year uh, hiatus, it will uh, it will be in this beautiful new Fenway neighborhood. We've got our new music venue out there, but we've got we've got a few more buildings to go. Uh, so we're, we'll keep at it, Chris. Wow. Is that a factor, Sam, uh, making sure that? The, the neighborhood construction is completed in time for the awarding of an all-star game down the road? It, it, it is one factor that would be helpful in terms of spaces and places and venues. Yes, for, for sure. Not a total requirement, just given the magic of Fenway, but it would, it would be helpful to have at least some of the, the project complete. The music venue, the MGM Music Hall at Fenway will really help uh, in terms of our efforts to land a game because of the things you can do there. Um, but uh, it'd be nice to have a couple more uh, buildings uh, completed as well. Last one, Sam. Uh, last year, you gave us a win total prediction, so I'll ask you the same one. The Boy, was 20... that a mistake. <laughs> Yeah, I think you were 10 over. So if you want to continue that, set it <laughs> set it at like 108 now. And yeah, you know. yeah. I am uh, absolutely not going to make any more uh, predictions or um prognostications, but I will say with, with good health, I predict a very competitive team. I think we're going to surprise people. Um, I think Red Sox fans are going to see, uh, as they have already started to see, frankly, at spring training. And I know it's spring training, um, uh, but um, I think they'll see uh, why uh, internally our baseball operations group is so excited about so many members of this roster. So my, our, our our hope is that we're going to be very competitive. We're going to surprise people and we're going to be uh, playing meaningful games uh, in September and hopefully get uh, into the playoffs. We know it's a tough division, uh, but I, I, I love Tristan Casas's quote. Uh, you know, if people aren't laughing, I think he said, if people aren't laughing at your goals then your goals aren't uh, high enough. So I think uh, Tristan said it well. And, and uh, I love that. That's the, uh, that's the approach in our clubhouse. He's a quote machine. Great for business for us, obviously. <laughs> That's, good. That's good. He's gonna be a net I hope he's a Netflix star. He will yeah. be, I'm sure. <laughs> well, Sam, that is our annual opening day uh catch up. I appreciate. I know they're not all easy questions or fun questions to ask. If they could all be about the all star game, we'd do that. But we very much appreciate the time. Thanks Great to be with you guys. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks.